it struck me that one thing we haven't touched on in this series, Warwick, is the the, the two people who've, who've talked kind of the most over the course of the, all these episodes, the eight episodes that have come before, have been me and you. And we haven't really spent a lot of time talking about whether we burn ships or how we burn ships or why we burn ships. And we don't have to get into too much detail, but I thought it would be fun for us to talk about and, and perhaps instructive to the listener. And I'll go first um, because um, um, as the co-host, I should go first. You should have the last word. Um, and and I, if I did a, an episode, if I titled an episode about my burn the ships moment that comes to mind when I think about it, it would be called from ministry executive to Hollywood PR agent, which almost sounds like it could be a movie. Um, and having worked in Hollywood as a PR agent, I, I kind of know how those things get developed. But very briefly, what, what that story was for me, and, 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 it, and it's interesting, Warwick, I didn't even realize I had a burn the ships moment until we were like midway through the show and we were midway through one of the interviews and it struck me, oh my gosh, yeah, that happened to me too. And, and, and what it was, was I had been, I was the vice president of communications for a very well-known Christian ministry focus on the family. And I was, you know, I, I think I might have said during that episode, you know, I was the guy, I was the the chief spokesperson beyond the president. And if, you know, if layoffs were needed, and I, I had like the third safest job in the place, right? The president had the safest job, but there was someone else, like the COO, and then there was me. Um, and so it, I could have um, it stayed there, um, but I felt like my job, my calling, why I was there had been done. We had transitioned from the founder, uh, James Dobson, to the new president, Jim Daly, a former guest right here on Beyond the Crucible. And um, uh, my job is the PR guy who, who led Focus's efforts to get stories in the media. Um, my job was to pivot the ship from the leadership of the founder to the leadership of the second generation leader. And we had done that. We had established, right? We had we had huge wins in the press. We'd established Jim Daly as the not just the president of Focus on the Family, but a next generation voice um, in Christian ministry and in, 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 in nonprofit Christian good works. And um, so I decided. Let's burn the ships. Uh, and I ran off to Hollywood. I didn't run off, but I had always been, you know, fascinated. And I, I always had passion for movies. Um, it, it manifests itself now. I'm constantly, uh, I've written a book on the films of James Bond. I've written a book on the films of Frank Sinatra with my uh, best friend, who's a film historian. We're in the midst of writing a book right now on the films of Bruce Willis. I've always loved Hollywood. I've always loved entertainment, television, movies. So I took a job, left focus on the family and the security, right? This is one of the things we talk about in our uh, uh, brave enough to make dramatic pivots, leaving behind safe and familiar lives. It was definitely safe and familiar. I could have done that job at the same level of, I, I was working hard, but I, it, it wasn't, I wasn't breaking a sweat many days. Um, and I went to Hollywood to promote movies both faith-based movies to faith press, as well as secular movies with faith-based aspects to them to uh, uh, men and women of the press who worked for faith-based publications. And uh, that was about a three and a half year um, uh, journey. Um, uh, it made some, uh, some, some, some great friendships, did some great work, um, uh, but it was indeed, there was, there was no turning back. Right. I mean, in fact, I I've never told you this. I don't think work when I first got there in Hollywood, like I got panicked and I, I almost wanted, like, I wanted to turn around and go back. I called my best friend from, uh, you know, from focus on the family and said, Oh man, I think I'm going to go back. I, I, you know, I, I feel out of like a fish out of water here. And what am I going to do? And how am I going to do this? And, and I, and I didn't, I, I, I stuck it out and, and it worked and, and it was a great bridge to what I'm doing now running my own PR firm. But that was indeed a, a, a total burn the ships moment. And I actually wanted to go back and the ships were burnt and, you know, I couldn't really go back and, but they weren't just burnt. I mean, the, I had a good reputation, still have good relationships with the folks who focus on the family. I probably could have gone back if I really wanted to, 
but the ships were burnt where we're going to talk about this here um, later. They were burnt in my heart. I had done the inner work that said, I'm ready for something else. My passions lie here. I've done this. I've been in this ship. It's been great. The sailing's been fine, but I'm longing for something different, uh, a different next act. And uh, at the end of the day, I, I stuck with the brave choice. So that's the uh, the um, uh, short film version of from ministry executive to Hollywood PR agent. Um, I know you have burned some ships. You've, as, as I said, when I introduced the show um, on every episode uh, on YouTube, um, uh, you have set some figurative ships on fire yourself in your career, Warwick. So, so what, um, what do your burn the ships moment or moments look like? Well, Gary, uh, yeah, thank you. I mean, when people think of my story, they think of, you know, the $2.25 billion takeover and 87 that, you know, three years later, you know, fail company goes into receivership and, you know, large Australian media company. But really my burn the ships moment in, in terms of pivoting in my career where I actually voluntarily burned my ships in that case, the ships were burned for me. It right. Was, you know, right. It, it was, was a, like a, you know, it's like a 200 ship armada that was burned for me. Yeah. You know, so that, it wasn't my choice. <laughs> it was a bit of a fire breathing dragon that sort of exactly. entered your life. There at that you time. Go. Yeah. Well done. Well done. Exactly. Um, so I guess for me, it was uh, 2003. It took me a lot of the nineties to figure out how do I move forward? And, you know, pretty hard to get a job as a sort of out of work uh, media mogul, so to speak. It, you know, it's right. horrible, but uh, basically I, um, Ended up getting a job in Maryland where we live uh, with an aviation services company doing financial analysis and then business, you know, some marketing strategy, strategic planning. And, you know, uh, it wasn't particularly a high level position, but I did well and, um, you know, got good performance reviews and all that. But I had this sense that, um, you know, literally in, in my cubicle, and it wasn't even the best cubicle, uh, <laughs> On the floor, of, it was the one where uh, <laughs> right by a main thoroughfare that went right down the building. And for those of us on the East Coast, uh, there's a freeway called 95 that goes from Maine to Florida. And I felt like I was on 95. It's just like people right. constantly pass my cubicles. I couldn't even get the, get the best cubicle. Um, but uh, I just felt like I was uh, playing small uh, from a faith perspective, which is the set of who I am. I felt like, you know... God had I don't, not bigger plans, but it's like I wasn't using all my gifts and abilities, uh, you know, for some some higher purpose. It, what I was doing was fine, but I felt like I was playing small, and that you know gradually gave me a sense of discontent. People of faith might call it holy discontent. That depends on your perspective, but I was pretty frustrating. So, uh, again, I got great performance reviews. I was doing fine. It was a company at the time that, you know, uh, provided uh, aviation information services to the major airlines. So, you know, it wasn't going anywhere anytime soon. I mean, airlines need that data link information. And so, you know, relatively stable company, I suppose. Um, and, you know, like 10 minutes from where I live. So, you know, what's not to like? But uh, again, I felt like I was playing small, and so uh, I quit. And um, uh, right around that time, I uh, got a um, did some analysis with a woman that did uh, executive coach that did bid career evaluation and advice, and she said I'd have a good profile for executive coaching. Didn't know what that was. Went to a conference in Denver and learned about it, and became a certified executive coach. But that was a big decision to quit my job and at the time i knew i wanted to explore coaching but when they asked me so what are you going to do well i'm not sure precisely but i just i need to leave and right. people are like what who does that and, <laughs> and and i'll just interject here to say that's a point that we're going to get through when we go through these five tips that we're going to offer you listeners exactly how you manage what warwick just talked about and if i had to give a name to what you just described warwick i would call it from a cubicle into coaching that's that's the first burn the ships moment you had exactly and one of the things we'll get into is vision and mission can be an evolution 
It mm. has been for us, which we'll get into later at Beyond the Crucible, but it was for me back then. So I love coaching. I felt like this is my community. I felt home. I love asking questions. I'm curious. I try to have an attitude of being of grace and not being judgmental. And the coaches are a credible community of, of you know, curious, caring folks. And as I began doing that, I got on some non couple nonprofit boards, and including uh, the uh, being an elder at my non denominational church in Maryland. And then that eventually um, segued into uh, the lead pastor of my church said, Well, Warwick, so uh, this is originally when I left the aviation services company, it was 2003. I you know, spent a number of years coaching and getting certified. And so then in 2008, the pastor of my church said, Warwick, we'd like to you to give like a 10 minute sermon illustration just talking about your story and lessons learned. And I did. And uh weeks and months after, people came up to me and said, you know, Warwick, your story really helped me. And I'm thinking, how could a like a you know right. former former media mogul, how could that story help anybody? Nobody's saying, Oh yeah, me too. I look like I <laughs> I had a billion dollar company and thank you. That was so helpful. I I, I feel right. like you, you you know me. Your story is my story. My right. story was nobody's story. None, zero right. on the on the planet. One out of I don't know how many billions of people live on the planet, but a lot. One out of you know a, a lot of billions. But somehow, by being honest and vulnerable, that touched people. So then, that led me to write a book, uh, which you know, came out in the fall of 2021. Crucible leadership: Embrace your trials to lead a life of significance. And it took a number of years to write and a number of years to get published. Uh, but, you know, if I can write a book, not so much a tell-all, but one about some lessons I learned, some themes from my family, inspirational and uh, historical leaders, then it was worth writing. So by pivoting to write that book, over the course of the year years, the vision evolved, grew, expanded, refined, refocused to become what we have now at Beyond the Crucible. So that was another another pivot, another at least burning some sales. I still do uh, coaching. But uh, my focus became on writing the book and beyond the crucible as a whole. So it was like a refocus, re-emphasis. But yeah, I guess they were they were two burning the ships moments. I guess the big one leaving the aviation services company, then the second one really refocusing from coaching to beyond the crucible. 